And we're back. We're live. It's the 12 o'clock block here on a Thursday. Uh, this is Think Tech, and more specifically, this is Community Matters. Today, we're talking about how Hawaii is going door to door on the mainland with some people who really are doing that, Lorna Strand and Davy Strand. They visit the mainland and they go to door to door and they talk to people about politics, which uh, takes a certain amount of fortitude and courage. Um, so, Lorna, let's begin with you. Why do you guys do this? This is, um, you know, not everybody does this. I wish more people would do this. Why do you do it? Well, I guess we, it, it kind of got into us um, when we were college kids, because uh, Jay, we started this about 55 years ago. And um, it seems like yesterday, but we started when we were both at Case Western Reserve University. Davey, Davey was in law school and I was an undergraduate and we volunteered. Well, 55 for... years ago, that's a long time. You guys yeah. look so young. And I, I was there, I was around at that time. And I know that 55 years ago, a Hapahali marriage um, was really special. So you guys were pioneers from the outset. Wow, kudos to you. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was illegal in some states. Oh, but my God. <laughs> we made it happen. Um, it, we met because we uh, were at Case West Reserve, but then we volunteered uh, for a man named Carl Stokes, who was a candidate for mayor of the city of Cleveland. And um, we did... We, we learned everything about politics through that campaign, um, real grassroots politics. We learned about the importance of having block captains in a community. We learned, we put together coffee hours with neighbors in a community. Um, we hosted, we helped to host busloads of college kids who came from all over Ohio over the weekend to sleep in church basements, to go knock on doors during the weekend. And um, we walked around neighborhoods, putting up signs in key places where we know the neighbors would talk um, about the candidates. And so we really got to feel what it was like to have boots on the ground and how a campaign can be run that way. Um, and fortunately he won and became, Carl Stokes became, one of the first African-American mayors of a major city. So we were rewarded in our work. And I guess that that experience, that that real life training helped to, to form who we are. And it has I guess so. You, it was a project the two of you worked on together. It brought you together. It was, uh, it, was <laughs> it, it defines you, doesn't it, over the years, eh? <laughs> yeah, and it's it's certainly not for everybody, but we, we um, we gained such uh, insight into uh, who we are and what we believe in through this process. And then also 55 years ago, we were involved in other um, things that uh, issues and events that were formative as well. And uh, Davy went down south, um, as a law student to help try to get folks out of jail in the civil rights movement. And um, I was an anti-war marcher. So I marched my feet off in Washington and Chicago and all kinds of other places like that too. So that was kind of part of our upbringing, I guess, in our formative years. And as a re result, it, we firmly began, felt that we, um, belief in face-to-face -face encounter when we're talking about issues and politics. We believe in communities banding together um, to, support, to support candidates. And we believe in supporting candidates who listen to the people. And um, it really formed us who, as who we are and why we do this crazy thing that we do, which is basically, um, after the, um, you know, raising our kids and having careers and in the Bay Area, San Francisco, we moved to San Francisco and um, raised our families and our family in the Bay Area. And we got involved in politics there too. Um, but it was not until 2008 that we, um, decided that we're gonna go outside of communities to other states. And it was Barack Obama who 
who inspired us to do that. And uh, so from 2008 and through the time that we retired, we both retired in 2012. And afterwards, we actually have gone to about 16 states knocking on doors. Mm. I, do you fund yourself when you make these trips or does somebody help you? We did it. We we did it all ourselves. But Davey can tell you a little bit more about well, that. I have some questions for Davey. Okay. Um, you know, you're, you're a lawyer and you have to get up on your feet as a lawyer, uh, whether you're a litigator or a negotiator, you're you still have to have to speak. And um, this is different, this kind of speaking, because you're now you're speaking to a stranger who may or may not like you. Um, you. You can't control exactly what kind of reception you're going to get in the door to door. So I, I just like to hear your, you know, your advice, your interpretation, your mindset when you knock on the door. Um, how do you approach this total stranger? What do you say to the stranger? It varies tremendously because um, when you do go door to door or, or when you're registering voters, you have a specific going door to door. You have specific people that you knock on doors. You, there's targeting. You, you don't just go to every door. You, usually there's there's a theory behind what doors. For example, you're trying to get out the Democratic vote. So you're going to the, the doors of registered Democrats. Um, uh, the. Uh, but sometimes it's very challenging. Uh, and I'd like to mention three different kinds of challenges, all that have to do with voter suppression. You know, today it's very, the, about 30 states, Republican legislators have uh, introduced legislation that the Democrats consider voter suppression and Republicans consider voter integrity. And we witnessed a lot of that kind of thing going door to door. Uh, for example, we were doing, um, Voter registration on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, which uh, is uh, we were doing it at the campus of different facilities of the local community college. And we were doing it with a local uh, Lakota woman. And we registered every other person we talked to. These students were in their 20s and 30s. That's great for a voter registration campaign. But why? Were they not registered? It's because the state of South Dakota made it so darn difficult to register. They, the state of Dakota, South Dakota said every organized county needs to have a place where people can go to register to vote. But the counties weren't organized. On the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, the second most expansive reservation in, in the country where there's a, a, a lot of poverty. And so there were, and we worked on other Indian reservations and there's tremendous state governments have done a lot to make it very, very hard uh, for Native Americans to vote. We were going door to door in Cleveland, Ohio, in an African-American neighborhood in the second Obama campaign. For 25 years in, uh, in Ohio, uh, it had been possible to vote on the weekends at the Board of Elections, the weekend before Election Day. The Republican Secretary of State had just cut that out before the second Obama election. So we were going door to door talking to people say, and they say, yeah, we're gonna go vote for Obama and, we, uh, and we're gonna go to church because what they would do, they, they call it souls to the polls. They go to church, the church would arrange for a bus to take everybody down to vote. They'd cut that out. That really got people mad, really got people mad. And, and as a result of uh, the voter turnout in that election in the, uh, the African-American areas of Cleveland exceeded the predominantly white area vote turnout for the fir first time ever. Those were both racially motivated voter suppression, but it even got more sophisticated. About two weeks later, we were in Colorado uh, going door to door for Obama again. And, um, and about half the people in Colorado voted by mail, absentee voters. Uh, just before the election, the Secretary of State, Republican Secretary of State in Colorado said, OK, if you voted in 2008, but not in 2010, we're not going to mail you a ballot. Um, so as we would go door to door, you know, this it's hard to in today's world to get this kind of information out. But the Obama campaign, very Akamai, very really a good campaign. They figured out people who had voted in 2008 and not 2010. And we went to those doors and knocked on doors with our Obama shirts and people say, we'll vote, we'll get our ballot in the mail and we'll vote for Obama. We said, 
You're not going to get a ballot in the mail this time, but nobody's going to tell you. These are people who've never gone to the polls. So it was another insidious voter suppression effort. And we had to deal with that kind of thing time and time again around the country. When you go to these states, so how do you choose the states? Uh, which, which states are the ones you put on your uh, itinerary? Uh, we, we try to go to states that have competitive races. In other words, if there's a close race between Democrat and Republican for senator or in congressional districts, we try to go to those districts where we can make a difference. Mm-hmm. Lorna, well, are, when you go out and do this, do you find you're in good company? I mean, are there other people from Hawaii, other people from other states who, who do it alongside of you? Um, do you find that there's, a, you know, an effective movement, uh, and I'm talking about recent years, um, of people who do go to door to door just the way you do? We, um, we have organized groups to go with us. Um, and uh, one, for example, uh, we were working in this little town in Nevada, in Mineral County called Hawthorne, and also on the Walker River Paiute Reservation, which is right next to Hawthorne in Mineral Valley. And we were working on behalf of um, um, a person running for, for Congress to, fill, um, to flip a seat and in Nevada. And we got so involved with the community that, um, that with the Democrats in the community that we invited some friends of ours from California to come and, and join us. And they did. And we put them up um, in, in, in the little casino that was there in Nevada. And, and uh, we all went out and knocked on doors in, in both the, the reserv- at both the reservation and in Hawthorne. And we covered basically the entire place. You ever run into uh, situations where you really have to engage in a colloquy with them um, and, you know, they have questions, uh, the resistance, uh, they don't like you, uh, they don't like uh, the Democratic Party, they don't like what you're selling, uh, whatever their orientation is, they don't like you. Um, and then you have, to, you have to make your case, or is it just uh, one side clapping? Well, you know, um... As I said, there's targeting. So you tend to go to places that you're either trying to get out people that think like you or not. However, uh, that's true. That's true. In in North Carolina, my, my favorite campaign place of all was in the western North Carolina, in the southern Appalachian Mountains, uh, near uh, the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, where um, we went and we uh, we recruited a bunch of people from other states, from Vermont and from uh, Maryland and from California and from Hawaii. And, um, and we, we were there and I emailed all the people before they came to that community to say, people are gonna be a little bit different here uh, than you folks on the coast. Uh, for example, you know, most people born along the coasts have been are in families that have been here for two or three generations. For example, three of my four grandfathers were born abroad in Europe. In in this part of Western North Carolina, the mo- most people are Scotch Irish, and their family's been there ten or twelve generations. And the people that are aren't the next biggest group are Cherokee Indians, whose people have been there, you know, from time immemorial. So I, I, I warned the people, if they come, you've got to think that when these people are going to be different than people you know, they're going to, they're going to be proud of their guns, for example. Uh, they're going to have, go to churches where their ministers are saying that abortion is something like murder. They're going to be people who are a little uh, uncomfortable with uh, gender uh, insecurity, insecurity and, and so forth. So, so keep that in mind. But on, on, the, on the working class economic issues. They're Democrats and they think like Democrats and, and, and you got to keep that in mind. So what we did there was uh, that, so that was kind of a warning on how to be sensitive to the kinds of feelings people will have. What we did there was put together local Democrats with people from out of state and we developed uh, walking lists of doors to knock on around the local person's own neighborhood and everybody from Maryland or California or Colorado I mean, or in other states who came would go with the person around their own neighborhood. And I, one, of my, one of my great experiences there was going, um, with, uh, going door to door on the Cherokee Reservation uh, 
the reservations are different than in the West. It was more like a working class suburban community knocking on doors. And everybody I talked to was a Native American. And uh, at one of the, and I was with a woman who was um, a Native, Native American. And, and uh, one of the guys said, I like your candidate so much, just a minute. He went back and he came out and he gave me a check for $250 made out to my candidate. I tell that because it's not what you might expect on an Indian reservation. So there's always surprises. Yeah, well, what, what about, you know, I mean, I think it, you, you're trading a, a, a needle there in a sense, because you're, you, know, you don't know what you're going to run into. You could, you could find a, the family is democratic, but they like guns, but they don't like abortion. So you have to you have to skirt that carefully, don't you? Um, you have to be very careful in a, in a state which has a sort of a, a mixed issue, a mixed issue population. Um, and and if you you know wind up talking about guns um, and discouraging gun ownership or gun encouraging gun control with somebody who's a Democrat, you may lose him instead of gain him. No. Well, that's why we talk about it first. We don't want to talk about issues that are going to be controversial. We want to, you know, the, the focus, for example, in this particular campaign was just going to Democrats and trying to get them out the vote and telling them that this guy that we were campaigning for was a Democrat. You don't really want to engage too much with issues if you think that you're going to disagree with people. We're, this is not a debating society, but uh, sometimes it comes up and, and, and you have to deal with it. I've had people who, you know, said, I've been a Democrat all my life, but, you know, the Democrats are, are gone crazy. All they care about now is killing babies and and having men use ladies' bathrooms. I mean, that happens. And you say, thanks, ma'am, and walk on to the next house. Yeah. You, you know, I, I've done this myself, uh, only here in Hawaii. And I've found here in Hawaii that a lot of people will shut the door in your face, even, even if they you know, would be inclined to agree with my, my candidate, uh, my party. Um, and they, they will say to you something like, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to talk about it. Um, you know, leave me alone. Uh, I don't, or I don't, my favorite one, I don't vote. I'm not going to discuss this. I don't want to register. I don't want to vote. I don't want to pick a candidate and shut the door in your face. That, that's right here in Hawaii. It's really surprising, actually. But the, I, I found that. that. Hawaii yeah. Too. Yeah. yeah. So when you guys go together, do you, I mean, when you go, do you go together side by side? Do you address them? How do you handle the person who wants to you know, it must be kind of a tag team thing <laughs> where you, you share the burden of trying to convince somebody who doesn't care to care, right? Some, some people um, go in pairs and partners and we, we always partner together, but we generally um, take our own lists and we uh, go on two sides of the street or we'll take a, a turf on our own. Um, because we don't go up to the house together. Uh, we're, we're kind of like to do our own stuff <laughs> like that. But in any case, one of the great things about modern campaigning um, is that th what David talked about in terms of targeting was is really essential. And the campaigns are, are so well trained now uh, to help volunteers address these issues and what do you do how do you approach a house um how do you, you know what's important and what's what when do you leave the house and go away um and how to keep safe do they invite um, you in do, do they invite you in do you get to sit in their living you know, room or do you stand wait, at the door you know, there there have been some times where we really wanted to go in they they tend to say the, the staffers will tell you that don't go in the house, <laughs> but uh, it, there have been times um, when we've helped people. For example, in Nevada, we did, um, we did uh, uh, helping people to the polls. And so we would go into the house to help somebody who, was, who needed help actually getting into our car to drive them to the polls, that kind of thing we, we could do. Um, so, but it, it's, I think, to answer your question, Jay, that we have learned so much from the staffers. And the Obama campaign, I think, was the cutting edge in terms of how to, how to be careful and train staffers. We met staffers all around the country who gave up 
like a semester of college to go work in some place uh, very different from their own home um, to 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 manage an office for Obama. And well, you were you were you the group uh, very successful uh, for Obama twice, but um, I'm you know I really want to get to the point of um, how this worked in the in the Trump um, the Trump era. Uh, did you go out in um, what is it twenty uh, what twenty fifteen? Um, and was it different? And do, you know, you guys uh, touched the grassroots. You were right out there where the people live. And so maybe you can explain to me what in the world happened in 2015 or 16, whatever it was, 2016. What happened? How did Trump get elected? Uh, he was really a, a, a dark horse, so to speak. And uh, he managed and you were there. What, what were people saying and doing and thinking uh, to support him? Well, I can uh, tell you, uh, one of my experiences was in Michigan, in suburban Michigan, where um, uh, the uh, the Republican candidate didn't run again because uh, he uh, it was a Republican district, because when he advised his uh, girlfriend to have an abortion, neither she nor his wife nor his church thought it was a very good idea, and he lost all his support. And our candidate was a, a, a Obama appointee who was in charge of trying to keep the uh, automobile industry in Detroit. And, and, and I went door to door for her. She was running against the Trump, um, the, the co-chairman of the Trump campaign uh, in Michigan. Anyway, the targeting really mattered. We were in de suburban Detroit and we were targeting Republican women going door to door. And one of our targets was Republican women because Republican women were turning away from Trump. This was big Trump years and this district had voted for Trump, but our candidate won. And part of it was this very uh, you know, intense, thoughtful targeting of what doors we were knocking on and what we were talking about. Well, uh, you must have been involved in the in the 2020 campaign just you know um recently and uh, that that's even more interesting in the sense that um whatever happened on that one because by then trump had achieved um you know maybe a, a greater cohesion of his base and the country was so divided about so many things uh and it's like going door to door has had greater risks in 2020 than it did ever before, I would guess. In Georgia, um, one of the things that they discovered, which is a still a very key state for for all of us to to look watch, um, one of the one of the little things that they very successfully did that helped Ossoff and Warnock win um, that seat, their seats in the Senate, was that there was a very determined effort to bring. Um, Asian language speaking um, folks from around the country into Georgia to knock on doors very specifically to Vietnamese families, Chinese families, Korean families, um, Indian, East Indian families, and, and talk to them about why it's important to register as well as uh, to vote Democratic. And it's it becomes so, so, so um, specific in in the way that folks are working now to um to talk to people to get to people to communicate with people and it is on the media on on social media but also door to door and even with the the pandemic there were folks who came from chicago and new york to georgia to do this work because they could speak those languages. And we're going to say, I'd like to segue now a little bit to what we're gonna look at in the future because yes. a lot of Democrats are now building a program of doing postcards. Uh, Davey's been man managing a postcard writing campaign for Oahu Democrats Blue Wave. But we are also building a, a language um, a language core of folks to do postcards to Georgia in Vietnamese, Korean, uh, Chinese, um, so that we can try to encourage them to 
to register to vote and that'll change to texting and then also change uh, switch later on to hopefully phone banking and we're supporting uh, we're really help working with a woman her name is B Nguyen who is running for the secretary of state position um, for the state of Georgia and she's helping us link into Georgia um, uh, so that we can do this program with Asian language folks. So, um, so what about the Republicans? Did you see them on the other uh, down the block doing the same thing? Uh, do they, they do they meet you in this competition, or are they um, you know uh, somewhere else um, not, you know not not committed to the this kind of door to door approach? David, I think that uh, that they yes we do run into Republicans. The Republicans are organizing hard, and we have to keep organizing hard too. It, it, it it's absolutely true. We haven't actually gone to the mainland since the pestilence started uh, a couple of years ago. So my last trip was to, to North Carolina with a group of people from Hawaii, uh, but we hope to do that again. In the meantime, we're really pushing on this uh, postcard campaign and getting people ready for telephoning and so forth. We've now had, we're, we're working on a postcard campaign with a group called Field Team Six in LA, which finds, which identifies names and addresses of people who aren't registered to vote, but will likely be Democrats if they do through a variety of methods. And we've now had a hundred people on Oahu who have written these postcards uh, to people with a, a, a way to help them to, to vote, to, to get to register to vote. And um, so we're trying to do all, but we hope that we can move into actually moving crews of people onto the mainland again, maybe starting in the summer. Well, that's the most effective way. I mean, postcard, you know, uh, that people can just throw that in the trash instantly. Talk about phone banks, they can hang up the phone on you. Although it's cheaper to do it from Hawaii and you have a voter registration list of telephone numbers, you can call anywhere in the country without standing up. Um, that's, that's really very efficient. But the person at the other end can hang up on you. Um, and that's, uh, and that's, that's a problematic in the sense that um, it, it discourages you. I mean, I've done phone bank work and it's, it's discouraging when they just slam the phone down before you get three words out. Um, but if you're at their door, that seems to me like the most effective way to actually engage with a voter. Am I right? It, it is. It is absolutely the most effective. It has been shown that that has more impact than than anything else. The other things are are, are good to do too. I mean, I, we travel around a lot because we we like traveling on the mainland. We've traveled even when we're not doing politics. We like uh, you know we hitchhike through Asia on our honeymoon, for example. So we like this kind of thing, and it's fun. But you do run into challenging situations. But it is the most effective way. Uh, that you can possibly campaign, I think. Lorna, do you run into anti-Asian sentiment when you go into some of these cities, particularly in the South? I mean, there's, there aren't any laws anymore about misogyny, but the fact is that there are people still in some places feel that way. Uh, what kind of reaction do you get from the, you know, the people who do feel that way? I've had um, anti-Asian um, responses all my life. Um, after I moved here, moved to uh, Ohio for college and on when in the on the mainland, but it it takes a minute. But after a while, people start to understand who I am, and yeah. uh, yes, there is there have been situations. So I guess uh, I guess I, I really want to talk about um, what's going to happen this year. <clears throat> um, this November, first of all, a lot of people will actually vote by mail. And you won't have much to say to them unless you're there early. Uh, so if you want to talk to those guys, you gotta you gotta get out early. Now the other the other thing is, um, I believe, and I would like your thoughts about this, is that um, given the, the suppression activity in so many battleground states, uh, which is really horrendous, um, people are going to be confused. They're going to be confused about how you can get the vote and how you can avoid all the barriers that are being imposed. And then after they're confused and they find that they've been suppressed, their votes have been suppressed in some way, um, you know, before, during or after the actual voting experience by these Republican led states, 
um, they're going to be angry. <clears throat> so I wonder how how are how are you coping with that, and how do you think this election, you know, will be different and special because of all the GOP activity in so many states, Davy? I um, believe that if people uh, become aware of what's happening, they will turn out in greater numbers and with more enthusiasm. I mentioned the black vote in Cleveland, for example, and, and uh, there, was a, there was an attempt uh, a couple of years ago in North Dakota to change the law. Between the primary and the general election, there was a change in law. You had to have a physical address on your driver's license to be able to vote. And on the Indian reservations in the West, there aren't very many physical addresses. There aren't streets and stuff. There's paths in, in out in the desert kind of where people live. And, and an organization in North Dakota was able to come up with uh, new cards for people with physical addresses, not 122 10th Street, but you know, descriptions and so forth between the primary and the general. And there was a huge voter turnout. So sometimes the effort to suppress the vote if it can be communicated to the people who are the victims thereof, they will get very angry and have the best vote up, turnout ever. And I've seen that happen in, uh, in various places. I hope that happens. Yeah, and well, yeah, yeah, story it's very important for that because that's the main way you can get to people because everybody has different sources of information. Yeah. So a lot of people, Lorna, a lot of people say that um, the Republicans, with all of their suppression and their campaigns, this and that, um, and their appeal to the base, um, you know, will take both the House and the Senate this year in the fall, be, you know, before Election Day and on Election Day, and, and then in lawsuits after Election Day, capitalizing on confusion and and lies and you know the, the big lie for so many races kind of thing. Um, so what are your thoughts about that? How do you factor that in? Do you think that with efforts uh, uh, you know, like you and uh, Davy are putting out you know, visits and door-to-door -door, uh, efforts that you, that you do, um, you can avoid that result? Or is, is that inevitable? Well, who Democrats uh, started our blue wave uh, committee in June, and we've been talking about this reality, possible reality um, since then, and uh, are looking at different things that we can do on here in Hawaii to address exactly what you're saying, Jay. And so our postcard program is going vibrantly. We're going to begin texting. Um, we're going to hopefully, I don't know, but I hope that we can do a Asian language uh, phone banking system here. And um, and then openly just go, we wanna go and start talking to people about it because that's how they get the message. That's how they, and, and that's all we can do. I mean, we, those who, whom we elect are trying to do their best in Congress, um, but that's all we can do here on the ground. And that's how we are made, we're on the ground people. Yes, you are. You are very special people doing it all these years and being completely committed. So I want to offer you both the opportunity to leave whatever message you want to leave uh, with whoever views this video um, about, you know, what you're doing and your thoughts about the, the nature of our democracy um, and, and how it will evolve over the next few years. Davey, what are your thoughts about that? Well, there are things that we cannot control that will have an impact on the upcoming elections. We can't control what happens internationally. We can't control uh, you know, what happens with inflation and so forth. But what we can control is trying to reach out and get those people that we know uh, are Democrats, get them to be sure that they get out and vote. And, uh, and it's a great experience doing it and seeing all the different kind of communities around the United States and, and learning a lot about it. Just an example uh, of that is uh, in, in the John Ossoff campaign when he was running for Congress to fill a special seat. I was going door to door trying to get vote on voting day. And we were in a neighborhood and all these people were 
in the suburban Atlanta walking around with um, yarmulkes on. And it was an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood and they couldn't vote because it was the last day of Passover. And so a couple of them had already voted by mail. So it was very interesting. Everybody was there because they had to be in walking distance of the synagogue. So you learn a lot of things along the way. Like if there's a group like that and the election's going to be on Passover, you better get people to vote by mail. <laughs> a lot of things like that. But really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So interesting, you guys. Uh, this is a, a depth of experience, you know, that few people have, and I, I admire you for it. Lorna, what are your thoughts about the future of our democracy? And, and I'm hoping that you could also um, talk to people about how they can get involved and do what you do, join you in some way, or at least follow, follow your footsteps. Throughout our entire experience, we've always been Democrats. Um, so the one thing that you know, I truly believe in is the Democratic Party. And um, and I, I hope that those who want to continue to save our democracy will join the Democratic Party and become active in whatever way they can to, um, to support candidates and to, to support efforts on the ground to, you know, to maintain our democracy because um, that's, what I believe, and I think that we can do it. There've been so many times in our lives that we thought, oh God, no, let's leave. You know, things are just gonna be awful in this country. And somehow we come through it. And, we, and the way we come through it is because we keep working at our democracy. Yeah. Laura Strand, Davy Strand, thank you so much for joining us. You guys are true national heroes. And we admire you greatly. Thank you so much.